come and listen to the unadulterated truth of God's word. But before we go into his words, first I'll talk to God and then I'll talk to you. Shall we pray? Our loving Father and our God, we come, O oh Lord, to this night, a night of decision. Help us, O oh Lord, even as we hear your voice speaking to us, that we, O oh Lord, may obey. Like the poem we heard a while ago about the little soldier. We pray, O oh God, that you may help us to go the way that you want us to go. And may we say tonight, where you lead me, I will follow. Thank you now, O oh Lord, for your Holy Spirit that you promised to send in your stead to guide us into all truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our subject for this evening, Sodom and tomorrow. Sodom and tomorrow. You know, there are more people today who are believing in the second coming of Christ, the second advent of Christ, than maybe at any other time in history. You can find such people everywhere. They are looking at the conditions of our world and they're realizing that this world cannot continue for very much longer. Talk about the second coming and people are willing to listen. Both scientists and world leaders are talking about global warming and the effect on the planet. Many are looking at the world's population and they know there is no way if the population continue with the present rate of growth, can this planet continue to be able to supply food, to provide food for all of its inhabitants. They realize that something is about to happen, but they do not know what is about to happen, and they do not really understand how this would happen. But my dear friends, as we study God's word together, we know that Jesus himself gives us signs about his second return, about his second coming. And uh, Jesus will come back. What do you say? You ask me, preacher, how do you know that Jesus will come back? I know that Jesus will come back because he said he will. He said it. My dear friends, he said in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, the Lord's promise. He himself said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So my dear friends, I know that Jesus is coming back because he always keeps his promises. And he says that he will come back. You ask me, why will Jesus come back? Well, Jesus will come back in order to put an end to sin. Sin cannot continue to reign in this world. There is always a limit to sin. There was a limit in the time of Noah where God says, enough. And God sent a flood in order to wash sinners away. My dear friends, how do I know that Jesus will come back? He's coming back in order to claim his own. My dear friends, the Bible tells us that God is going to send the angels in order to gather the saints, in order to take them back to heaven with him. You ask me, why will he come back? He's going to come back in order to make the world brand new. And we looked at that last Friday night. He is going to make a new creation more beautiful than the first. My dear friends, you asked me tonight, why would Jesus come back? 
My dear friends, Jesus is going to come back in order to shut up the devil's big mouth. My dear friends, we studied last Friday night in Revelation 20 and verse 3, it says, speaking of Satan, it says that he cast him, Satan, into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should what? Deceive the nations no longer. So Jesus, my dear friends, is coming back. But I want to let us know tonight that simple, a simple knowledge of his coming is of no use unless we are ready. We have to be ready. It reminds me of the, of, of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Five were ready and five were not ready. It says, those who were ready were called wise, and those who were not ready were considered to be foolish. There are always two classes of people. We learn about in Matthew 25, we learn about the, the, when Jesus Christ comes and he's going to set the sheep and the goat apart. There's always a division. When Jesus returned on last Friday night, I indicated that there are going to be some people inside of the city, and there are going to be some people who will be outside of the city. My dear friends, there are only two classes of people in our world. There are the lost and the saved. The lost and the saved. God only sees two classes of people. He doesn't see black and white and yellow. He doesn't see nationalities. He simply sees those who obey him and those who refuse to obey him. My dear friends, the second coming will be a day of gloom for the lost. A day of gloom. Amos chapter 5 verses 18 and 19 tells us what it would be like for the lost. He says, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? He says, the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man ran from a lion and a bear met him, or he went into a house and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. My dear friends, it reminds me of the sinking of the Titanic, April 14, 1912. Over 1,500 people lost their lives when that boat went down. History tells us the band was playing secular dance music. But when they realized that the boat started going down, they changed the tune to nearer, my God, to thee. My dear friends, but on the other hand, I want to let you know that the coming of the Lord is going to be a day of joy and gladness for the same. What do you say? Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4 tells us that it will be a day of joy. He says, and I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are what? Former things are passed away. It will be like the day of emancipation for the slaves. It will be a day of joy and excitement. My dear friends, just one look at Jesus Christ. It would be worth it all. We would forget all of the troubles of this world. Just to see Jesus for one moment. Just for one second, my dear friends. A day of excitement. And that is why the Bible tells us, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 and verse 44, that we ought to be ready for his coming. We ought to be ready. My dear friends, I want you to imagine. Imagine that I told you that I have this wonderful mansion in California to give to you. I'm paying for the flight. The mansion is already paid for. All you need to do is to go to the airport, <laughs> well, let some, and fly all the way to California. And I gave you your ticket. And I promise you that the mansion is yours. I showed you pictures. Huh? 
I gave you a virtual tour of the mansion. My dear friends, it doesn't matter what I did. If you do not get on that plane and decide that you're going to go to claim your mansion in California, all of that promise and all that mansion means what? Nothing. It means nothing. Even if I gave you the, 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 the eyewitnesses accounts, my dear friends, it's the same thing. It is the same thing with the promise that God has for us. If we learn about it and believe in it, but we do not take the step that we need to take in order to accept the ticket to heaven, it is of no use. In other words then, knowledge is of no use except it is acted upon. My dear friends, the Jews knew the prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah. They knew all the prophecies of the first coming. They knew the prophecies concerning his first advent. They even knew the very town where he was going to be born. They knew that. My dear friends, in fact, when Herod called in the scribes of the Pharisees to find out where Jesus Christ was going to be born, they told him, my dear friends, the account says in Matthew chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4, it says, when Herod the king had heard these things about the birth of a new king, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they were able to tell him that he was going to be born in what? Bethlehem of Judea. The question is then, if they knew where even Jesus Christ was going to be born, why didn't the Jews receive Jesus since they were expecting him? Why didn't they receive him? My dear friends, they did not receive him because some of them were afraid to be put out of the synagogue. They were afraid to be put out of their church. Are you with me tonight? My dear friends, the church and the priest meant more to them, was it more important to them than Jesus and his truth? Jesus, my dear friend, had told them that the very church in which they were worshiping, the great temple, with its white marble walls, with its gold-plated walls on the inside, he told them that not one stone will be left upon another. My dear friends, the only church that matters is the church of Jesus Christ, upon which he says, I'm going to build this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. My dear friends, many times people come to meetings like these and they hear the truth of God's word, but they are so wedded to their church that their church and their position in the church means more to them than the truth. And they are willing to dismiss, willing to dismiss the truth in order to hold on to their church. My dear friends, there are others, other people who are afraid of persecution, they are afraid to stand up for Jesus Christ and his truth. But my dear friends, to stand up for truth always means persecution. My dear friends, I'm reminded of Stephen. Stephen, who gave witness to his faith, he preached his last sermon. I mean, it was a tough sermon, a tough one. And you knew, he knew, I'm sorry, that he was preaching his last sermon. He knew that. He said some tough things. Huh? And the Bible says, my dear friends, they gnarled their teeth. They took up stones and they stoned Stephen. My dear friends, I want to let you know that people do not love the truth today any more than in the time of Stephen's. People love when you tell them nice things. You make them feel good. You tell them that they can drink what they want. You tell them they can live how they want. You tell them, take a little bit of wine for the stomach's sake. You tell them it doesn't matter which day you worship on. My dear friends, you tell them that their grandmother is in heaven. Watching over them, my dear friends, people love to be fooled. Just it. People enjoy lies. They love the fool. And I'm telling you, my dear friends, people do not love the truth today more than in the time of Stephen's. And I'm telling you tonight, my dear friends, when you stand up for the truth, there are always going to be people 
They may not stone you with stones, but they will stone you with words. Stone you with words. My dear friends, Paul was persecuted. He said, I received 40 lashes, save one. I was shipwrecked. He had a difficult time. And my dear friends, there are people today who are standing up for Jesus Christ and they are suffering persecution because of that. Well, my dear friends, remember that God promised in Revelation chapter 7, he says, these are they, speaking of the saints, these are they which have come out of great tribulation. Jesus told us plainly, if we're going to follow him, we got to take up our cross and what? And follow him. And Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So my dear friends, there is no way around it. Once you're standing up for truth and righteousness, the devil doesn't like it. And he's trying to bring everything in your way in order to discourage you. People who haven't called you for years will call you when they hear that you have decided that you want to be a part of God's remnant church. When they hear that you want to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. When they hear that you have thrown out all the bacon and the pork that was in your refrigerator. People want to know if you're crazy. And people who haven't talked to you for a long time will want to call you. My dear friends, it tells me that you are swimming upstream. You see, any dead fish can go down with the current. But it takes a live and living fish to go up against the current. But my dear friends, I want to let you know that in your moment of persecution and trial, that God will always stand by your side. What do you say? Always stand by your side. My dear friends, Mark 10 and verse 29. Mark 10 and verse 29 says, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left what? House, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land for my sake and the gospels, but he shall what? But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, and house, and brethren, and sisters, and others, huh? and brought mothers, and children, and lands with persecution, and in, in the world, what? World to come, you're going to receive what? Eternal life. My dear friends, Jesus Christ knows the sacrifice that we have to make sometimes in order to follow him. But he says he's going to be by our side. And he says that there's a reward that is waiting for us when we follow him. My dear friends, we need not worry. We need not worry. All we need to do is to be faithful. For we are going to receive our reward in the another life. My dear friends, still others were traditionalists. Traditionalists. In other words, then, they were saying, well, our fathers did this. And so, therefore, we got to do the same thing that our fathers did. Huh? They challenged Jesus and said, you know, when Moses said this and, 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 and Jacob said this. But, my dear friends, these Jews, they were blinded by tradition. And they could not see the light. This is what the old prophet of old said about them. He said, but I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourself with what? With idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my, ju and keep my judgments and what? And do them. The prophet Ezekiel had to warn the children of Israel, says, do not walk. In the path of your fathers, because they forgot me, they went in the wrong path. My dear friends, there are some people today who are holding on to a hand-me-down religion. They are saying, when they come to hear the truth about the Sabbath, they come to hear the truth about the death, about, uh, 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 about death. They come to hear the truth about clean and unclean food. And they say, we'll tell you, well... My grandmother born in this church and died in this church. My mother born in this church and in this church. And I born in this church, I'm going to be buried in this church. Are you with me? They are holding on to tradition. Holding on to tradition. Yet at the same time, they have the latest iPhone. Well, their grandmother didn't have the iPhone. So how come they have an iPhone? 
How come, my dear friends, when it comes to salvation, people can make some strange excuses? Some strange excuses, but they're not consistent because their grandmother used to ride in cart and buggy, but they are driving to road town. My dear friend, they should have said, cart and buggy is good enough for me because it was good enough for my grandma, so I'm going to remain in my cart and buggy. My dear friend, God expects us to do the best we can. Maybe your grandmother didn't know better. Maybe your mother didn't know better. But my dear friends, you know better. And when you know better, God expects you to know better because God is going to hold you to account for what you know. For what you know. My dear friend, I grew up with my grandmother. And I've heard my grandmother say something. We live maybe about three miles away from the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. I would guess about three miles. And my grandmother would always says, you know, at Christmas time, they always say that the ocean is calling for people. What she means by that is that in the night, you can hear the waves even though it's so far away. Okay? That's what my grandmother would say. They say, at Christmas time, the ocean does be calling for people. Now, when I went to school and in high school, and I did physics, and I learned about refraction of sound. In other words, then the bending of the sound. And because in the Christmas time, huh, the place is colder during the night, close to the land, therefore then the sound tends to keep close to the land. It bends towards the land when the season is colder. So my dear friends, I'm not going to hold on to what my grandmother says at Christmas time. Why? Because now I know better and I have this scientific explanation. Are you with me? So what I'm saying, my dear friends, as we learn better and we know better and we understand better, we got to live according to our knowledge and what we know. We got to live according to what we know. My dear friend, there are some people who hold on to a hand-me-down religion. They remind me of the clothes man, the cloth says, man, I'm sorry. He had a yard, but it was only 33 inches long. So all the time, he's selling cloth at huh? 33 inches. A yard supposed to be what? 36 inches, 3 feet. But my dear friends, honesty ended after somebody pointed out to him that your yard is only 33 inches. Are you with me? Before that, you could forgive him. But after you show him that his yard stick is not 36 inches, it means therefore then that what? He's not a dishonest man. My dear friends, we might have been practicing something for years. But when it has been pointed out to us in the Bible that what we thought was right wasn't right after all. My dear friends, our honesty ends there. My dear friend, Acts 17 and verse 30 says, In the time of ignorance, God winks at. But when we know better, God expects us to do what? To do better. Expects us to do better. My dear friends, the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20, that we should do what? And hallow my Sabbaths, that there shall be a what? A sign between what? Between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. My dear friends, he said, Jesus rebuked the scribes and Pharisees, says, these people draw nigh unto me with their what? With their mouth. And honoreth me with their what? In their lips. But their what? But their heart is what? Far from me. My dear friends, there are a lot of people who go to church and they jump up and have a good time. They even sweat sometimes. Having a good time. And they go home and feel, well, well I, I, I went to church today to get my praise on. But my dear friends, that means nothing to God if we do not have an obedient heart. Says these people... They can talk a talk. They can talk about loving Jesus. But they don't want to talk about obeying Jesus. My dear friends, he's our savior, but also our Lord. Our Lord means that we have to obey him. He's in command. My dear friends, if we love him, we'll do what? Keep his commandments. They honor me with their lips. But it says their heart is far from me. When error is pointed out, we got to do what God asks us to do. My dear friends, Many people, um, Jesus says, but in vain, they do what? They worship me, teaching for what? Doctrines, the what? The commandments of men. Oh, my dear friends, tonight, I've offered $10,000. I've offered $10,000 here 
in Capoons Bay, Totola, on the play field. All those who are online as well to can apply. If someone can show me just one line in the Bible, just one scripture line that says that God changed the day of worship, the day to be kept holy from Saturday the 7th to the first day of the week. All you need to do, Google it. Ask your pastor. Ask your preacher. Whatever. You can. I just need one line that indicates that God changed the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday and I'll write you a check for $1,000. So far, no one has showed up for the money. This tells me, my dear friends, it can't be that things are so good in Tatola. Things are hard in Tatola. It can't be so things are good, so nobody wants my money. It simply means, therefore, my dear friends, that there is none. There is no evidence to be found in God's word. My dear friends, if there is no evidence to be found in God's word for the transfer of the day of worship from Saturday to the Sunday, what ought God's people to do? We ought to do what? Remember the what? The Sabbath day to keep it holy. My dear friend, the Bible says that after we come to know God's truth and we go back to our old ways, we are doing what? It says what? In vain, they're worshiping me. Teaching for what? The doctrines, the commandments of men. My dear friends, I've shown you in Daniel 7 and verse 25 that God predicted a power is going to rise that would try to change his fourth commandment law. I showed you in history how the Roman church said that we transfer the day from Saturday to Sunday. No and no authority in the Bible. They're honest enough to say that. Honest enough to say that. And my dear friends, I want to let you know tonight that after we come to that knowledge of the truth and go back to worshiping on Sunday, my dear friends, the Bible says you're wasting your time. You're worshiping God in vain. I didn't say it. Who said it? Jesus said it. In vain do they worship me. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. My dear friends, the time comes when we ought to get rid of the Bible stroller religion. Many people are still in the Bible prime religion. They say, well, this is how my mother and my father brought me up. I'm going to stay that way. But my dear friend, time doesn't sanctify wrongdoing. Doesn't matter how long you've been doing something. Doesn't, san doesn't satisfy it. Different still others. Some are following the crowd. There are always going to be people who follow the crowd. My dear friends, why is it that so few people follow the truth? Follow the truth. Jesus Christ himself says, Enter ye in to the what? Straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And plenty of people will there be who go in what? There at. What about the way of righteousness? It says what? Because straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, means difficult. Huh? Straight, that straight means difficult. For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. That what? Leadeth unto life, and how many? And few there be that find it. My dear friends, I am always amazed that out of a whole world, there were only eight people that went on the ark. Out of a whole world, eight people went on the ark. But my dear friends, those eight people were saved because they obeyed. God is looking, my dear friends, today for people who are not people who are following the crowd, not people who are looking for the biggest church with the most popular preacher. He's looking for people who are willing to follow him and follow the truth and follow the Bible. My dear friend, I want to let you know that truth has never yet been popular. You don't follow the crowd. You follow the way in which Jesus is leading you. Follow the way in which Jesus is leading you. Eight people imagine out of a whole world were saved. But if you're outside of that ark, you are lost. You are lost. My dear friends, why? These are the same reasons why so few people were saved out of Sodom. So few reasons. My dear friend, let us in our imagination go back in time to the last night in Sodom. Sodom is sitting near Jordan. South of the Dead Sea. Sodom was a perfection of wickedness. And my dear friends, as I study ancient civilizations, it seems as though that immorality and homosexuality is the last peg before destruction. Every time you reach a society that comes to a point 
where they think that there's no difference between a man and a woman, look out for God's judgment. Look out for God's judgment. My dear friends, I, I think it was 1879 when Mount Vesuvius blew up huh, and covered that Roman resort. Covered that Roman resort. This is a picture of two men in bed covered by the, 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 the Mount Vesuvius ashes. That's how they were it, that's all they found. My dear friends, the volcano erupted, caught them in the act, and destroyed them, my dear, my dear friends. I want to let you know that when men and women reach to the point where they cannot even accept the fact about their own sexuality, my dear friends, you know that they have reached to a low ebb. It's a low ebb. And my dear friends, that was what Solomon and Gomorrah was like. My dear friends, Lot, Lot, was a righteous man, but he was vexed, his soul was vexed by what was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah. My dear friends, I want to let you know that Lot was a good man in a wrong place. My dear friends, tonight, there are a lot of good people in the wrong place. There are lots of good people in the wrong place. There are a lot of good people, my dear friends, who are in churches who are still holding on to Sunday. They are in churches that are telling you, you can eat what you want. They are in churches who are telling you that your, your, your mother and your father and your grandfather is in heaven. But I want to let you know that inside of those churches, there are honest people. They are seeking people. They are searching people. And when they come to recognize and understand the truth, they realize and say, I can't stay here any longer. I can't stay here any longer. My dear friends, Lot was a good man, but he was in the wrong place. My dear friends, tonight in Totola, tonight, and all those who are online, there are lots of good people, but they're in the wrong place. Lot was a good man, but he was in the wrong place. My dear friends, God has sheep everywhere. Everywhere. John 10 and verse 16, he says what? And what? And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold. And what? One fold and one shepherd. My dear friends, in verse 23 says, But ye believe not because what? You are what? Not my sheep. As I what? As I said unto you. Verse 26. My what? My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they what? And they follow me. My dear friend, simply because people go to church doesn't mean that they're God's sheep. Simply because people love to go to church doesn't mean... That they are his sheep. How do we know that they are his sheep? When they hear the voice. Huh? When they hear the voice, they respond. They go. They might have questions, but they ask those questions to get clarification. They go. My dear friends, when I was like maybe 14 years old, a gentleman in the village gave me a goat to take care of. Never took care of animals before. A black goat. I named that goat Annie. And I'll come. May uh, like 12 o'clock and so forth, uh, lunchtime I'll come. And we had Thai Annie, you know, she has the grass there to eat. But in case, you know, um, she finished to eat, and I'll come. By the by, 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 is a, a, a gut. You know, you know, you can't cut gut in total, right? The gut? Right, okay. By the gut, and I'll come as well, I say, Annie, Annie. And I could listen to the way in which Annie answers me and know whether she's satisfied or she needs to be moved off. Are you with me? But all I'm saying, my dear friends, Annie knew my voice. She knew my voice. My dear friends, I want to let you know that when you're after truth and you're seeking truth and you're in love with Jesus Christ, you recognize his voice. You recognize his truth. Because he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. My dear friend, there are people who come to meetings like this and they hear the truth and they turn away angry. They are not his sheep. Not a sheep, because I say the sheep hear my voice. And they follow, and they love me. My dear friends, I want to let you know there are people who love other things better than Jesus Christ. Love other things better than Jesus Christ. My dear friends, when the call goes forth, in Revelation 18 and verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, who? Talking about Babylon. Come out of her, what? My people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of a place. My dear friends, Babylon represents confusion. We are living in a time of religious confusion. 
We're living in a time when one church says, oh, there's a rapture, there's a secret rapture. Another church says, oh, no, you need to speak in tongues if you, if you, if you want to show that you have the, 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 um, the, um, um, the Holy Spirit. There are other churches that say, you know, uh, when you're dead, you're in the grave. They say, no, when you're dead, you, 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 you're in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with us. My dear friend, we are living in a time of religious confusion. And Jesus Christ is saying, my dear friends, the message is going to go forth with the truth. And he's going to call his people out of Babylon. Call his people out of confusion. And when they hear his voice, they're going to respond. They're going to come. My dear friends, that was what? That was the position of Lot. He was a good man in the wrong place. God decided to destroy the city for its wickedness. The account tells us. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. He says what? I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which is come up unto me. And if not, he says what? I will know. My dear friend, that is what you call the investigative judgment. We spoke about the judgment here. God never brings judgment without first doing an investigation. And he does not have to come down in order to know. He already knows. But he wants to know that you know that he knows. Are you with me? God came looking for Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was. Adam was in the garden hiding. But he wanted Adam to know that he knew where he was. When God asks us a question, it is not because we are informing God. God just wants to know that we know that he knows. So my dear friend, the Bible says, I've heard the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah. So I'm going to go down. I'm going to try the case. And then I'm going to give the verdict. And then I'm going to administer the punishment. My dear friends, I want to let us know that we serve a fear and righteous God. What do you say? He doesn't take rumors. doesn't accept rumors. He's going to investigate for himself. My dear friends, that is what he did. And this is why he was. That's what, my dear friends, he's going to do with this world soon. God gave up. And the time is going to come when God is going to give up on this world. My dear friend, it is a terrible thing when a God who is a God of love and a God of compassion, when he gives up. But my dear friends, my God is also God of justice. He's a God of holiness and he's also God of truth. God of truth. My dear friends, he has to destroy sinners. While he loves men, he will destroy sin. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsake them shall what? They shall have mercy. My dear friend, God is serious when he says that we must get rid of sin. God demands obedience to his law. My dear friends, remember Cain? Cain gave the wrong sacrifice by offering fruits. My dear friend, God did not accept it. My dear friends, we have in, in 2 Samuel 6 and verse 6, we have the story of Uzzah. God had said, while they were transporting the, the ark of the covenant, God says, nobody touched the ark. But while the cart was going, he fell in a hole. Unless he was on one of the holes here in, in, in Tatola. He fell in a pothole and he puts out his hand in order to try to steady it. Good intentions. huh? He did not want the communion table to fall. Put out his hand, but when God says, don't touch, don't touch. And the Bible says, Uzzah fell dead. My dear friend, I want to let you know, God is very particular about obedience. My dear friends, that is why Psalm 40 and verse 8 says, I delight to do thy will. My dear friends, Sodom was a lawless and godless place. Sin was in. Sin was in. The law was disregarded. My dear friends, God is particular about sin. Whether it is in individuals, whether it is in families, or cities, or nations. Why? Because God cannot forget that sin cost him his son. Cannot forget. Cannot forget that sin cost him his son. And so Abraham started to plead with Jesus to spare the city. Why? Because he knows that his cousin Lot was down there. Did not want the city to be destroyed. He knew that Lot was there. And so, he started negotiating with God. So Abraham Jr. said, Will thou also destroy the righteous 
with the wicked? With, 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 with God would just destroy everybody. God says no. And so, Abraham started to negotiate with God. He said, what about if there are 50 good people down there? God says no. I, I, I'm. Abraham says, don't be upset with me, God. But what about if you don't really find the full 50, but 45? He says no. He said, Lord, don't be upset with me. But what about 40? What about 30? What about 20? And the Bible says that Abraham went all the way down to 10. And God said, if I could just find 10 decent people in all of Sodom and Gomorrah, I would spare the entire city. My dear friends, the Bible tells me that the righteous are the salt of the earth. The only reason, my dear friends, why God spared Totola in Irma is because there are good righteous people here in Totola. I want to let you know that the unrighteous person is standing on ladder. If you take all of God's true believers out of Tatola, this will be the end of the BVI. Yeah. My dear friends, God spares a nation because he knows that his people are there. My dear friends, I want to let you know that Christians are the salt of the earth. A salt preserves. My dear friends, you might be the only Christian on your job. And they might make fun of you. But my table, I want to let you know that that job is doing well and that company is doing well because you are there. My dear friend, the Bible says that God blessed the household of Potiphar because Joseph was there. God blessed the prison, my dear friend, in Egypt because what? Joseph was there. My dear friends, I want to let you know that life may be hard at times as a Christian, but I want to let you know that because you are there, my dear friend, God blesses the entire company because there are some faithful people in Carrot Bay. God spared the whole of Carrot Bay. My dear friends, God doesn't change. And the Bible says, if God had just found 10, 10, just 10, the whole city, even though they're so wicked, the whole city would have been spared. My dear friends, you know what that tells me? Don't quote me on this one. I don't have a Bible text for it. But this tells me, I cannot believe that if God could have found 10 people in the time of Noah, he would have sent, wouldn't have sent the flood. He only found eight. Only eight people were saved on the ark. Something tells me, because God doesn't change. So something tells me that maybe if God had found 10 people who were willing to go on the ark, he'd have said, let's forget about this flood. Ten, my dear friends. And God departed. Abraham couldn't go any lower. But Abraham was thinking, you know, at least Lot, his wife, his daughters, um, they, 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 their husbands, and children, I know that at least there are ten righteous people in Solomon Gomorrah. So Abraham felt confident because he knew that his cousin Lot was there. My dear friends, tonight, I want to let you know that God has a remnant people. A remnant in the time of Noah, it was eight. When it appears as though everybody's doing what they please, when it appears as though nobody wants to obey God and following God, but I want to tell you, my dear friends, there are 7,000 who have not bowed their knees to bear. They're always, my dear friends, righteous people. Young people, I want to let you know that when it feels as though other young people and everybody else is doing their own thing and doing their thing and you are the only one that is waiting for marriage, I want to let you know that God has 7,000 people who have not bowed to bear. They're always people. Always, God always has his people. Always has his people. My dear friend, there's a remnant. A little flock in the days of Noah is only eight people. But my dear friend, there was a remnant. There was a remnant. So my dear friends, God left. And he went to Sodom and Gomorrah to tell them and to tell Lot they need to get out because I'm going to send rain. I'm going to rain fire on the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. The account tells us in Genesis 19, 12 to 14, and the men said unto Lot, Has, uh, do you have anything here? Do you have anything here beside? What, you, 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 okay, you have your son-in-law, you have your sons, and you have your daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, it says, bring them out of this place. Everything is going to burn. Like in Maui, uh, uh, um, Hawaii. Everything is going to burn. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to do what? 
to destroy it. And Lot went out, and he spoke to his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But the Bible says, the Sad account says, But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. My dear friends, the angel came before the city and said, we are going to destroy the city. Lot had been preaching for years. Now was the time for the, now for the final time. His own relatives, his sons-in-laws, laughed at him. Laughed at him, my dear friends. It's possibly even that he lost daughters and sons. My dear friends, isn't it strange when people can laugh at an offer of salvation? Isn't it strange, my dear friends, when people can mock at an offer of salvation? My dear friends, tonight, God still calls his people to come out of her, my people. The fires are soon to rain on this world. God is looking for people who would stand up for truth and righteousness. And my dear friends, I want to let you know that that call is as serious as a heart attack. It's as serious as death itself. As serious as death itself. My dear friends says, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, have to hurry him out. Have to hurry him out. My dear friends, sometimes we are in meetings like these and there are Bible counselors who are getting up by somebody and encouraging them to go forward. And sometimes there are members who are saying strange things. My dear friends, there's sometimes some people need a help to get to this altar. The angels hold their hand. Some people need to be pulled out. Arise, he says. Take thy wife. Not that you're forcing anyone. As you see, as you see in a moment. You can't force anyone. You'll see in a moment. Arise, take thy wife. Thy two daughters, which are here, because I want to let you know, the city is going to burn and everyone who is in this city. So get out. Because the city was going to be consumed because of its what? Because of its iniquity. My dear friends, the Titanic. The Titanic had 20 lifeboats. Each could have held 58 passengers in those 20 lifeboats. You multiply that, you'll get 1,160. Yet, only 705 people were saved. Why? There were some people who allowed the lifeboats to go. They said, you can't go, I'm going to catch another one. Some people, you couldn't rush them. They said, I need to put on my good dress. I need to fix my suit, so go. My dear friend, there were some people who thought that the unsinkable ship couldn't sink, so they needed time to make up their mind to go in the lifeboat. And there were some people who simply did not believe that the ship was actually going down. And so they stayed on the ship. Over 1,500 people lost their life. Lifeboats that could have hold. 1,160 or 705 people went in. My dear friends, the Bible says that the angels had to rush lot. Had to hold his hand and pull him out. His wife and two unmarried daughters out of the city. The Bible says that the angel hastened them. My dear friends, it is a most dangerous thing to hesitate when God calls us. A most dangerous thing to hesitate. My dear friend, God is in a hurry to save you. There is urgency in the invitation. There is urgency. My dear friends, why? Why is there this urgency tonight? There is urgency because it is most dangerous to hesitate when God calls. Most dangerous to hesitate. Dear friends, why? It's dangerous to hesitate because the grip of sin and the world becomes tighter. Things are not going to get better. It's going to get tighter. Why? It's important to go when God calls because the problems are going to get bigger. Problems are not going to get easier. They're going to get bigger. My dear friends, I had an elder in my church when I was growing up. Elder Bedford, he's now sleeping in the Lord. He used to have, we call it ground in St. Kitts. You call it ground here too? Yeah. Garden up in the, in the hills? He had ground. And so, in St. Kitts, we have problem with monkeys. 
Monkeys would come around to reap your harvest for you. But they're afraid of dogs. So what you'll do is that you place a dog to guard. When the dogs see them, they bark, and the monkeys run away. But some monkeys are very smart, and they see how far the dog can go because the dog is tired, and they will still go in the garden where the dog cannot reach. They are very smart creatures. Anyhow, and he would often say that sometimes the dog doesn't really like to be up in the mountain. He prefers to be at home. So sometimes he will get a train, tie the, tie the dog, and the dog would break away from the train and find his way all the way back down in the village. And what he has to do, next time he take up the dog, he has to make sure he put a what? A stronger train. Something bigger to make sure. Just, my dear friends, when the devil realize that you're coming to meetings like these, that you're learning new truths like these, my dear friends, he plays chains of circumstances around you. I'm not asking, I'm telling you. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. My dear friends, I remember when I was a student in Barbados. We were going around because as students, we were going to have evangelistic meetings like this. And we went out into the village, here nearby the, 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 the university. And we went there every Friday, every Saturday afternoon, we went out, have an open ear, and we went around to get people to sign up for, 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 for Bible studies. And I could never forget, my dear friends, let's call her Karen. I remember I went by Karen. And I, Karen was very interested, very interested in Bible studies. I gave her, she would do the studies, next, next time I would bring them, and she would, you know, I correct them and so forth. She was eager. We were going to have meetings like these in the village church as students. And so when it was time now for the meetings to start, I went by Karen. I said, Karen, guess what? Tomorrow night, we're starting the meetings. He said, I'm sorry, I can't come. I said, I mean, you can't come. You've been doing so well with the lessons. How do you mean you can't come? She said, I, I can't come. I said, what happened? She said, um, I'm pregnant. An unmarried young lady. I said, Karen, how do you mean you're pregnant? When I heard the story, my dear friends, the very Saturday afternoon, when she started doing the lessons, she went out that Saturday night, and she got pregnant the same night. The same night, my dear friends, I want to let you know, my dear friends, that we are in a battle. We are in a struggle. And the devil hates your guts. I couldn't convince her to come. I tell her God will forgive her. There's nothing I could have said. She didn't want to come. The very night, we just started the lessons. The very night she went out. My dear friends, I could give you stories and stories like this. But I want to let you know, my dear friends, that when we have come and tasted and seen that the Lord is good, my dear friends, the devil put two imps on you where he had one. Try to find every way now to discourage you. Dear friends, I want to tell you that the devil is a rascal. A rascal he is. Dear friends, I want to let you know. You think you have problems now? After you have tasted and seen. After you come to meetings like this and learn things like this, my dear friend, the devil is going to be on your track. Trying to discourage you and dishearten you. It cannot be the same again. My dear friend, there was a friend I had, Brother Danny. A friend I had came to meetings like this, 1981, I think it was. He came to meetings like this. Pastor Glanville Allen, wonderful evangelist. Pastor Glanville Allen was preaching. And he came to the point and he says, you know, um, well, you know, I need to make a decision. And, and he was wavering. But my dear friends, he was the head of the youth choir in the Moravian church. He was head of the youth choir. And so he said, if I leave, who is going to lead the choir? Are you with me? The choir meant more to him than God's truth. Are you with me? He said, if I leave. And so he was convicted. And so he never left. He, never, he, 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 didn't, he did not get baptized. A couple of years after that, I met him again because as a student, I used to work at a, a biomedical research center in St. Kitts. We used to work on monkeys, trying to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. And I met him on that same compound. And I used to have Bible studies every lunchtime with my workers. And he would never come. And one time I went to him and says, 
Why you don't come to the Bible study lunchtime? All the other guys come there and join it. He says, Ray, I can't go to that again. I said, go to what again? He says, when I came to the cool state, I was so disturbed, I couldn't sleep. He said, I can't go to that again. He doesn't want to hear again. He knew the truth. He knew what he needed to do. He went through a turmoil of heart and mind. And he says, please don't tell me anything again because I don't want to go through that again. Sometimes I couldn't sleep at night. Wow. Wow. Dear friends, I bleed within my heart. Someone say, I don't want to hear the truth anymore because it upsets me. It makes me feel uncomfortable. I can't sleep at night. My dear friend, I want to let you know any problem you have now is going to get bigger. If you think, my dear friends, that you cannot come and give your life to Jesus Christ because your boss wouldn't give you all for your job, my dear friends, I want to tell you, no, my, the boss, my dear friends, is going to give you more work. It's going to become harder when the devil sees that you have an interest in Jesus Christ, my dear friends. He starts to work on you. He starts to work on you. He starts to work on you. Problems become bigger. My dear friends, Satan works harder. He works harder. My dear friends, the risk of being lost becomes greater. Becomes greater. And the voice of the Spirit becomes softer. Becomes softer. 19, in 2016, I had meetings like these in St. Croix. There was a young man who was invited to come to the meetings. He never came. I want to learn about this afterwards. And then, about a couple, min a couple months after the, 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 the meeting closed, one of the sisters in the church came to me. She says, Pastor Edwards, she said, you know, you heard about the guy who drowned in Cape Christian State Bay? I said, yes, I saw it in the news. He said, you know, I'd invite him to come to the crusade, you know, and he never came. That was his last invitation. And he didn't even realize it. Didn't even know it. In those same meetings, I baptized a lady in those same meetings. And six months afterwards, attended a funeral. She didn't realize that she was making her final decision. My dear friends, I want to let you know that when you come to know the Lord and when you have opportunities like this, you don't know if it is your last. You don't know. Same crew said I told about my friend who said he didn't want to hear anything. Warner's Park, Kayon. Griffin, Brother Griffin and his wife, they're now sleeping in the Lord. Brother Griffin, he was a Moravian. For all his years, 69 years old at the time. Never once came to the meeting. Maybe there are some people who are listening to me in their homes tonight. And maybe every night. And that's what Brother Griffin never came out of the tent. Just came on his veranda, pulled up his chair, and he would listen. And finally he said, that's the truth. We got to go. And his wife tell him, but honey, what people going to say? You know that we always, Moravia, we born in Moravia, we're going to die in Moravia. He says, he told her, well, you can stay, but I'm going. And so she said, well, pops, well, if you're going to, um, if you're going, I'm going with you then. And so she decided to go with her husband. And she came. And both of them went down in the water together. And they were both baptized. Six months after that, she had a stroke. Went to the hospital. Never required. Never recovered. I attended a funeral. Ella Griffin, Brother Griffin, lived maybe to be like 90-something years old. 98, I think he was, when he passed. And he always would get up in church and testify. He says, I wish that I accepted this message earlier. I wish I accepted. My dear friends, I want to let you know that there are people who have been in the same position like you, but when they heard the truth, they says, it doesn't matter where you grew up in. It doesn't matter where you have been. My dear friends, my dear friends says, my sheep hear my voice, and they what? And they follow me. It is important to follow. My dear friends, the Bible says, we are coming closer and closer to probation. It draws nearer, and so mercy's door would be closed. Forever, my dear friends, that I don't know when it's going to close. I don't know. That's why it says, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. 
Different it says, and while he lingered, while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful, the Lord was what? Merciful unto him. Huh? They were hesitating. They were merciful unto him. And they brought him out forth and set him without of the city. My dear friends, difficult to leave things behind. It's difficult to leave relatives behind. It's difficult to leave associates behind. God had to use force in order to get Lot and his family out. And so he told them, escape for your life. Escape for your life. But unfortunately, my dear friend, the Bible says that Lot's wife looked back behind her and she became a pillar of salt. My dear friends, salvation cannot be effected against one's will. You might force someone, but my dear friends, if their heart doesn't change, it makes no difference. My dear friends, Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Why? Why, my dear friends? She looked back, she lingered, and she lost. Why? She was unwilling to break with the past. She couldn't see herself living without her luxuries in Sodom. Make like, most likely, she was a native of Sodom. But my dear friend Jesus says, How be it in vain do they worship me? Teachings for doctrines, the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things that you do. And he said unto them, um, Full well, you reject the commandments of God that you keep your own tradition. My dear friends, there is no choice apart from Christ and his word. No choice, my dear friends. My dear friends, friendships can't help you. My dear friends, maybe you should be thinking about the reading club that she was a part of in Sodom. What about the cooking club that she was a part of in Sodom? What about the ladies? How would the ladies get along without her? But my dear friends, when God says, move, 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 it's time to move. My dear friend, we need to profit from her example tonight. My dear friends, she could not be reconciled with the present. No luxuries and comfort. She did not appreciate God's mercy. It was inconvenient hardship and trials for her. She couldn't think of herself how she would be living outside of Sodom and Gomorrah. But my dear friends, I want to let you know that when God says that we ought to move, it's a time for us to move. And my dear friends, God took Sodom. God took her out of Sodom, but he couldn't take Sodom out of her. And my dear friend, she became a pillar of salt. My dear friends, on the Titanic, some did not put on their life jackets because they did not want to get their clothes dirty. Lot's wife was rudely taken out of a bed of roses and a life of comfort to a life of discomfort. And she did not appreciate the mercies of God. From a lap of comfort to a bed of stone, she didn't want to be rushed. She needed more time. She wanted to be taken to heaven on a flowery bed of ease. My dear friends, the angels had to force her out of Sodom. My dear friends, the psalm says, in Psalm 119 and verse 60, I what? I made haste and delayed not to do what? To keep thy commandments. My dear friends, obedience should not be delayed. My dear friends, she was fearful about the future. She might have been thinking, how would I make it? I may not hold out. But my dear friend, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. My dear friend, she was maybe wondering how she's going to make it. But Jude 24 says that we serve a God who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the, the throne of God. My dear friends, you don't have to worry. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 says, that Jesus himself is the author and finisher of our faith. My dear friends, some people think that if they keep the Sabbath, they will not be able to make a living. But my dear friends, just think about it. Just think about it. Do you think that God was taking care of you when you are living in disobedience? Now you are living in obedience. Do you think that God is going to give you up? 
Doesn't make sense to me. You are living in disobedience before you knew better. And God was taking care of you because you're still alive. Do you think that suddenly God is going to give you up? No, you start to follow him. My dear friends, doesn't make sense to me. But what did you know? Philippians 4 and verse 19 says that my God shall supply all your needs according to what? His riches in glory. My dear friends, Psalm 58 and verse 13, we looked at yesterday. He said, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, not thine own pleasure, not speaking thine own words. He says, then shall I cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. My dear friends, the Bible says that when we keep God's Sabbath, you are going to be well fed. And I want to let you know, that there are over 21 million Seventh-day Adventists around the world who is proving that promise to be true. God doesn't leave us. God doesn't leave us. My favorite text, Psalms 37 and verse 25, says, I have been young. I have been young. I have been young. I have been young, Elder Sal. And now I'm old. Yet, have I not seen the righteous forsaken? Oh, he's what? See, begging bread. My dear friends, when you stand up for God, God stands up for you. When you walk in a path of obedience, he's going to take care of you. My dear friends, Lot's wife, a lost woman. Why? Because she looked back. My dear friends, don't look back tonight. All you need to do is to look forward to Jesus. He's beckoning you tonight. He's beckoning you tonight. See, he's beckoning arms. He's promising you eternal rewards. He's promising you honor. He's promising you youth. Eternal youth will be yours. God the Father, my dear friends, would bless you abundantly. My dear friend, Lot, Lot and his daughters were the only ones who were saved from a whole city. Why? Because they obeyed. Because they obeyed, Genesis 30, 19 and verse 24 says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. My dear friends, Lot could have made excuses. Lot could have made a number of excuses, but he obeyed. Lot could have said, my job but he obeyed. He could have said, Lord, what about my home? But he obeyed. Lot could have said, Lord, what about my friends? But he obeyed. Lot could have said, what about society? But he obeyed. Lot could have said, what about my church? But he obeyed. Lot could have said, Lord, what about my wife? But he obeyed. Lot could have said, Lord, just give me some more time. I need some time to pack a few things. But my dear friends, Lot obeyed. My dear friends, Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says, And being made perfect, speaking of Jesus, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that what? All them that obey him. My dear friends, he was saved just in time. I want to let you know tonight, Jesus will soon return. Jesus will soon come. The deadly, deadly plagues of God's judgment are soon to fall upon this world. That is why God calls us. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out. Come out of her, my people, and be ye not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. My dear friends, Matthew 10, verses 14 and 15 says, and whosoever shall not receive you, talking about the disciples, talking about this preacher man tonight, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of the house of that city, shake the dust off your feet. Shake the dust off of your feet, he says. He says what? Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than what? Than for that city. Why? Because today we have more light. The greater the light, the greater the punishment. He says it shall be more tolerable. 
for that city. My dear friends, what would you do with the message that God has called you? You might, that's like Lot tonight, be a good person in the wrong place. God has revealed some wonderful truths to you as you have listened online and as you have come out here night by night. What are you going to do with those truths? That is going to determine, my dear friends, your eternal salvation. Jesus himself says, behold, tonight I stand at the door and I watch and I knock. And my dear friends, the latch is on the inside, not the outside. He's not going to break down the door. Jesus is a gentleman. He's waiting for you to open. To open the door. My dear friends, tonight I want to let you know that Jesus is still the problem solver. What do you say? I want to let you know that Jesus is still a forgiving savior. I want to let you know that Jesus is still the life-changing Lord. I want to let you know that Jesus is still the miracle worker. Whatever your situation is tonight, my dear friends, all you need to do is to give him your heart and your mind and your life and he would make something beautiful of your life, my dear friends. Tonight, my dear friends, dear friends, Jesus is calling. He's calling you tonight. What shall you do? It is your decision. That night, that fatal night, that last night in Sodom and Gomorrah, that night was Lot's final night and decision. My dear friends, I don't know. Tonight, could be your final night. I don't know. I'm not a prophet, not a son of one. But all I know that God says, when you hear my voice today, if you hear my voice, you do what? Harden not your heart. Let's stand to our feet at this time. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others, thou art calling, do not pass me by. baptism and Jesus is looking for men and women who are honest enough who are brave enough to say yes to him and my dear friends you don't have to know how it's going to work out you don't have to see the way Jesus already had the way prepared for you he told Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. There were obstacles along the way. But for every obstacle, Jesus was the solution. Amen. My dear friends, if you are here tonight and you're saying you want to be a part of that baptism this coming Sabbath, I want you to leave where you are and take a walk of victory tonight. My dear friends, the angel that spoke to Lot is here tonight. Is here tonight. And the question is, would you remain in Sodom? Or would you leave? 
would you leave? And so even as we sing the next stanza, I'm going to ask it, I'm going to ask that you leave where you are and come forward tonight indicating that you want to be a part of the baptism this coming Sabbath. Take a walk of victory tonight, my dear friend. Take that walk of victory. Let's sing as we move. Let me. Let me and thy throne of mercy. Only for us, only for us to move. Find the sweet somebody else jump in the hole and said bury me too. My dear friends when it comes to salvation it is between you and the Lord. It is between you and Jesus. Right now nobody else is here except you and Jesus. That is why my dear friends I'm pleading with you. God's Holy Spirit is pleading through me to plead with you. Take that walk of victory tonight. You might say it's not easy. I know it's not easy, but my dear friend, but when Jesus went into Golgotha's hill to be beaten and whipped for you, it wasn't easy. See him in the garden of Eden. See him in the garden of Gethsemane tonight, my dear friend. He's bowing, he's bleeding, sweating blood. It wasn't easy, but he did it because he knew that's the only way he could save you. Feel the nails in his hands tonight. Feel the thorns of the, the crown of thorns on his head. Feel the spear in his side. My dear friends, he did it for you. If you were the only one, he would have gone all the way to Calvary to die for you. My dear friends, what are you going to do with these truths that have been revealed to you? You are here tonight not by accident. God had a divine appointment with you. He had a divine appointment with you. My dear friends, as we sing the next stanza, move. All you need to do is to take the first step. The Bible says, when the prodigal son father saw him, a great way off, the Bible says he ran. Ran, hugged him and kissed him and brought him home. My dear friends, all you need to do is to take the first step and you're going to see Jesus running to you like the prodigal son to bring you to this altar tonight. My dear friends, it's a time and moment of decision just between you and the Lord. You don't have to know how you're going to make it, my dear friends. I want to let you know all you need to do is to put it in the hands of Jesus. He's a miracle worker. He can work it out. You got problems, he can solve every problem. Whatever your situation is tonight, my dear friends, just take that walk of victory tonight. Do not allow this coming Sabbath to pass you. You don't even know if you're going to wake up in the morning. You don't know. You don't know. You see, I'm saying that in order to scare you. Huh? The Christopher family came to Carrot Bay. Came to Carrot Bay. On their own. Just came. Mommy said that I was convinced that I need to keep the Sabbath. And so she came one week. Came another week. First time she had a communion with foot washing. Right here at Carrot Bay. A couple of months ago. And she had communion with us on the Sabbath. That was the first and last. By Tuesday, she had gone. 
falling asleep, but thank God in Jesus. Why? Why? Because she obeyed. She obeyed. She obeyed the spirit that told her that she needed to remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. And she came without invitation. She came. Didn't know that that was the last opportunity. My dear friend, I'm not saying something to scare you. I'm telling you that's the reality of life. I was baptized when I was 11 years old. My younger sister, I showed you a picture, Patrice, was eight years old. She didn't make it to the end. She didn't make it to the end of the meetings. She died before the meetings were over. Eight years old. Eight years old. So my dear friends tonight, I plead with you. I beg you in the name of Jesus and the one who died for you. Make the decision tonight. Make that decision that you're going to go all the way with Jesus. As we sing the next stanza. Trusting all in his merit. Trusting only in thy merit. Oh, would I see that face? Would I see that face? Take a walk of victory tonight, my dear friend. Maybe right now you're still in your seat. But deep down in your heart, you know that you should have joined those who have come forward tonight. But somehow you didn't have the courage to come. And you just want to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. You can raise your hand at this time. All our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just want to raise your hand and say, you know you should have come forward, but you didn't. But you just want me to pray for you at this time. God sees your hands. God sees your hands. Shall we pray? Let's pray. Our loving Father and our God, we want to thank you for the victories that have been gained tonight, both here under the tent and online. We thank you, Lord, that there are always those who are brave enough to say yes to Jesus. We pray, O oh God, that you might remember those, O oh Lord, who know they should have been here, Somehow they feel as though there's some problems, there's some hindrance in their way. And they cannot understand how it will be worked out. Help them to know, Lord, that you are a great problem solver. Amen. Help them to know, Lord, that they don't have to wait until everything is cleared. Because that day would never come. They need to come and you would clear the way. So I pray, oh God, that you may continue to be with them. And may continue to speak to their hearts. Continue, O oh Lord, to give them no rest. Tonight, as you did to my friend so many years ago, help, O oh Lord, that they may be able to go to sleep tonight until they go on their knees next to their bed and say, Lord, I yield. And I'll be in that water this coming Sabbath. Thank you, O oh Lord, for hearing our prayers. And may, O oh Lord, you be with us as we journey home now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.